welcome our vibrant Dr. Thank you, Virginia. I'm sorry I didn't live up to your expectations of being a little bit more robust and bold. With the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, Professor has to ensure that I lose 15 pounds before coming here. To be a representative, you have to look trim and fit. So, so with no further ado, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This morning, I have been given the task of presenting to you on the prevention and control of cervical cancer, and to give you a Caribbean perspective. And the speakers before me have actually made my life a little bit easier because they've touched on a lot of things that I'm going to emphasize in the presentation. I first want to apologize to my colleagues and those in the audience who already know this information being presented on the next few slides, but I thought it should be fundamentally clear to all persons here that if we are attending an advocacy workshop on cervical cancer, that we all know exactly what the cervix is, its function, detail what primary prevention is, secondary to prevention, and tertiary prevention. And this slide was actually borrowed from Dr. Kanda, which kind of summarizes all the programs that we need, what, what advocacy is going to help us with in getting the burden of disease reduced. And this allows us, cervical cancer is one of those amazing cancers that it has a pre-cancer stage that you can pick up. And it actually now with the Nobel winning prize in identifying HPV, if you can prevent HPV infection, you can prevent cervical cancer. So, primary prevention encompasses methods to avoid occurrence of disease and most population-based health program efforts of this type. In the Caribbean countries, our women are becoming more aware about the HPV vaccine. Women are asking their doctors about it for them and even their daughters. Can my daughter be vaccinated? And NGOs like yourself are beginning to offer this service before the governments can. And this is not only in part due to the demand by your patients, but due to less bureaucracy to get such a program launched, on a smaller scale it's easier, less finances, you probably pass on the expense to your consumer. So the Barbados Family Planning Association, they've started to offer the cervical vaccine before the government. The government's not going to roll out their program until September this year. But you're making a difference, and we want to continue and give you the tools that you can make this difference. And we need to get away from this stigma, okay? Cervical cancer can affect anyone, okay? And, and there are social conservatives out there that believe, you know, my child is not even sexy active. How can they become, how can they get cervical cancer? And, and I think the age of puberty is coming down. I think in Professor Hassel's day, puberty began at 14, 15, 16. Now girls at 9, 10, and 11 are undergoing puberty and their sexual debut is earlier. So, it's very important that we don't ignore the facts and we offer our girls the vaccine. And it doesn't have to be like this, okay? The vaccine is not a sign of promiscuity. Secondary prevention, screening and early detection involves three modalities, cytology, VIA, and HPV DNA testing. Dr. Kanda mentioned those. Cytology is basically the study of cells and George Papanicolo, he was the one who realized that examining vaginal secretions can actually pick up pre-malignancy. And he went on, and how a pap smear is done, basically, cells are collected from the surface of your cervix by a doctor or nurse. The cells are checked under a microscope for any abnormalities, and if abnormal or precancerous cells are present, they can be treated before they turn into cancer. And cervical cancer can be found in the earliest stages. And this is how it's done. Basically, you position the woman's legs like this. You pass a nice cold speculum, you identify the cervix. I know a lot of you women there are turning at this graphic description, but the speculum doesn't have to be cool, it can be nice and warm too as well, okay? Once you identify the cervix, you take a brush sample, either using a wooden spatula or a brush, you plate them onto a slide, and you send them off to the cytologist. And that requires somebody to do something. You have to actually take the slide now and carry it to a cytologist, somebody to read the slide. That's what Dr. Kanda was mentioning. It requires personnel. These slides are then examined, normal cells, precancer cells, and cancer cells. And then if these cells are abnormal, you have to do a colposcopy. Colposcopy, as the name suggests, colpo-uterus-oscopy, looking at the uterus. So you're actually looking at the cervix with a microscope, okay? And what you're doing, you're directly looking at the cervix. Here, it looks normal. Here, it looks a little abnormal. What we do, we use certain dyes, and we take a tissue biopsy. Because at the end of the day, all you have with the pap smear are cells. You need tissue to confirm your diagnosis. Once you've confirmed your diagnosis, 
then you can offer appropriate treatment. And the cervix relatively has little nerve endings, okay? So when you see that little punch there, Dr. Prado is making that suggestion to the audience, um, it's not that painful, okay? And that's me saying so. But if you treat these lesions beforehand, then you don't have to go back and see your doctor. And screening with pap smear, there are limitations, the sensitivity of the test, you actually require equipment and personnel, people to do the pap smear, a cytologist to read it, follow up with the patient and give them a result. Every time, pap smear, get the result, recommend them to a colposcopist, biopsy, get a result again, and then offer them treatment. And you know how doctors' waiting rooms can be. It can be very long, huh? I don't know why these guys make you all wait. <laughs> the other modality is VIA, visual inspection with acetic acid, and all you require here is a speculum and a pair of eyes. Okay? You can look at the cervix, you can place acetic acid on the cervix and you can see abnormal areas. And these abnormal areas can be treated at the same time. Okay? Um, you all know what acetic acid is? Vinegar. Yeah, so you really can call it VIV if you want instead of VIA. But then being from the Caribbean, I don't think Sir Viv would appreciate that. He would tell us to keep walking, okay? <laughs> and it's quite easy. Um, the results are immediate. You see the lesion, you treat the lesion, there's no follow-up. And then this moves us on to number three, HPV DNA testing. And as I mentioned before, this has been groundbreaking research. And what they've realized is that you can vaccinate women and prevent HPV. But if you, instead of doing pap smears and looking for abnormalities, if you can look for the high risk HPV before it causes abnormalities, then these are a subset of people that you can monitor or, sur or provide increased surveillance so you can prevent them from getting cervical cancer. And the advantages, the samples can be collected by a trained provider or in the case of vagina sampling by the woman herself. It's not as subjective because you don't have somebody's eyes looking at it. It has a higher sensitivity than pap smear. But the problem is, it is expensive. It takes six to eight hours for results and results require follow-up treatment. Okay, so that's a summary basically of screening and early detection. As we mentioned, that encompasses everything that we need to. And I think all of this today Tomorrow, we'll achieve our Millennium Goals. The Millennium Goals are to implement implementation of cervical cancer prevention and control programs, contributes to the attainment of a Millennium Goal development through universal access to sex and reproductive health services and improve women's health. Thank you. There is a microphone. Let me apologize to Dr. Davidson from early by saying Jamaica red and dread. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, we're known for many things, good and bad. We just do them very well. Okay, um, thank you for your excellent presentation and also the presentation for, from Dr. Candle. This is just a comment. Um, as it relates to data on cervical cancer incidence and mortality within the Caribbean, uh, this is where we have a huge gap because the data that's being reported is from Globetan. They're not usually using actual data, it's estimates. So, for example, for Jamaica, we have um, a cancer registry which just covers the Kingston and St. Andrew area. And um, their rate is 17 and 17.5 per 100,000 population, um, the incidence rate. And we are seeing a trend down. Over the last 15 years, we've seen like 31%. Um, but this certainly points out the need for us to have cancer registries in place. Um, they are a component of a national cancer, comprehensive cancer control plan. And so I just wanted to highlight that. So if we don't really have good data, then it's difficult to also uh, point to where we need to focus our efforts. Um, secondly, is once we have the whole access in terms of capacity, that capacity, and now with the new technologies, we have a lot more options. Um, there's still a whole issue of fear. So once women are diagnosed, referred, there is a fear to move on to really get treated. And so that's something we also in the Caribbean set to do. Thank you. And thanks again for a very vibrant and excellent presentation. Certainly, you don't mind a refresher on the basics of cervical cancer. Thank you. Yeah, she's right correctly. The data out of Jamaica, from Kingston, San Andrew, Dr. Gibson looks at her, the rates there, but it doesn't reflect the whole island. And 
that's why Global Camp doesn't accept that as itself as what Jamaica's rates are. But you're quite correct, we need to boost our resources, we need to have the data available so we can implement policy, as Dr. Candace said. The Caribbean is specific in that it doesn't have much data. So to guide policy, you want to have evidence-based management. Any other questions? Comments? Yeah, Vikash, um, I informed you a question as a cardiologist, I hate to add, so not my area at all. I am formed the impression that cancer of the cervix in the Caribbean, and I'm going to deliberately word it like this, is, is dealt with very badly by us in the Caribbean, compared to, for example, the other uh, female breast, the other female cancer breast cancer. What are some of the reasons for that? Is, first of all, am I correct? And secondly, if I'm correct, what was your Share with us your perspective on that. Okay. Why that? And when done, there seems to be so much more going on with breast cancer and so little with this, this significance. And I'll give you the Barbados Cancer Society's answer and then I'll give you my personal answer. Breast cancer is more common than cervical cancer. So when I mention gynecological cancer, cervical cancer is the leading cause of gynecological cancer. Breast is the form fall under gynecology. But money is dedicated to reducing breast cancer. It's easier to screen. You don't have to go and part your legs. You don't have to be uncomfortable by having a, a speculum pass. And, and to me, women don't embrace, I mean, you accept it. Developed countries, women go every year and get their pap smears. And, and they recognize that the benefits of it. But then when you get somebody out there who doesn't even want to go to a doctor, far less undress in front of them, have an internal examination, have a test taken, then come back six weeks later, depending on how long it takes you to get a result, and then we told that the result is abnormal. So the screening test, although it's one of the most successful screening tests ever devised, it has that interpersonal problem where it's invasive. Uh, breast cancer, you can do a mammogram, it's uncomfortable, you can do self-breast examination, quite easy, and you can pick up the lump. So it's that whole sex taboo, that whole... And then with HPV coming out there, people think that, oh, this is a sexy transmitted yeah. cancer. But <laughs> and that's why I made that point. You can have had sex with one person your entire life, and still be at risk of surviving cancer. Because most persons, men and women, have been infected with HIV. I know I speeded up to get the presentation covered. You may miss some points, but you can always ask me. Yeah, I just want to make a comment again in relationship. I think, Please um, fill the microphone. Thank you. Uh, there's really um, nobody who will come out acknowledge the fact that they have cervical cancer. We see a lot of movie stars acknowledging the fact that so there's almost like a following. People proudly tell or share the fact that they have breast cancer. That will never happen for cervical cancer because of all the things that you said. So until we can get past that, I don't think we're going to break some of those barriers down. Okay. You're quite correct. I mean, two years ago I went to the American Congress meeting in Chicago and you all know the nanny, the TV show, Fran Stressler, she came out and spoke and spoke about how she had cervical cancer and she had treatment. Now, a lot of cervical cancer, the early stages can be treated with surgery. Radical hysterectomy, you remove the cervix, the vagina, the, the cuff of the vagina, and most of the time, you're okay. But if you need chemotherapy or radiation therapy, imagine radiating the vagina. What happens? It shrinks. It stops producing the lubrication. There are a lot of side effects from it. So persons may not want to go and disclose that information because of fear, fear of sexuality, fear of how they feel inside, that you know how they would be looked at, that they had a cancer which in, in itself was sexually transmitted. And as I mentioned, you don't have to be promiscuous to catch HPV. You could have had intercourse long time. Good morning, I must say thanks for your presentation. My name is Keo Mahimer. I am the founder and president of the Kila Heart Projects here in St. Martin. And currently, for the past, here we have had an ongoing cervical cancer awareness program on the island. And to add to the question that Mr. Hassel asked, or the suggestion that he made, it's I think before women actually have the bravery to go out to a gynecologist and get a pap test done, it starts with being aware. 
because that, that is what happened to me and that is basically my drive to make our community aware of it. We need to know the facts. And I always say whenever we have, a, whenever I have an interview, someone asked me once, why do I think breast cancer is so out there and cervical cancer isn't? And I always will respond by saying this. It took one person to start to speak of their experience. It takes only one, and that will enlighten us. And the other person who is standing in the back or sitting in the back, who is basically experiencing the same thing, it gives them courage to come up and say, but it starts with the awareness. And when we start it, then it will become like a fire. It will actually blaze. And that's where it actually has to start, with the awareness. It basically heals, and it encourages people to actually come out and speak. That's a very good point. And I think as cancer societies of the region, it's our job to make 